we developed a methodological note. Robin weighed in on it, and we defined what we thought these case studies should look like in a series of questions. We defined, what do you mean by transformative urban change? If you do a Google search on this, you'll see there's a lot of books with transformative and urban in the title, and we looked at people writing about transformation in terms of social movements, the civil rights movement, in terms of the industrial revolution, a lot of different ways to look at this. And we, so first and foremost, we're interested in transformation that makes cities more equal. Because we can all think of cities that are transforming, but are becoming uh, more unequal. So that is not the type of transformation we were interested in. We wanted transformation that transcended a single sector, that was multi-sectoral. We wanted evidence of institutionalization, and we hypothesized that this would, in most cases, involve multiple stakeholders. So it wasn't going to be completely driven by the state, or completely by civil society, or the private sector, that there was going to have to be some type of coalition formation. And like all of our WR papers, like the sectoral papers, we have defined a set of enablers. So we talk about governance, finance, and planning as being our enablers, and di distinguishing them is sort of a semantic thing from solution sets because even though we might be talking about transportation, we might be talking about housing, you have these enablers that cut across all of these different sectors that facilitate our solution. So a solution set being like in the housing paper, informal settlement upgrading, getting rental markets right, doing urban infill. We have solution sets and then we look at these enablers and how they make those possible. Also in the case studies, we look at governance, finance, and planning as, as enablers. So if you, if you look at the framing paper, Anjali and I and, and Michael worked on, and with a lot of uh, consultation and argument with Ani, um, we, we, I always feel like you should be a co-author because you spend so much time arguing about it with the framing <laughs> paper. <laughs> so a lot of Ani's ideas are reflected in the framing paper. So we had um, two not really case studies, because they're sort of, sort of superficial in some ways, st stories of Medellin and Surat and how transformative change happened there. And for us, that was just really important to have that in the framing. So when we used that term, it was a proof of concept that people knew what we were talking about. People were like, what do you mean by chance? So we sort of spelled these things out in the framing paper. And we very quickly show in these two different cities that you could have this transformative change that made the cities more <coughs> equal and uh, it was sustained over an impressive period of time. And so we came up, and this is the diagram from the framing paper, this chart, which sort of outlines our theory of change, as I sort of described to you, as our enablers. We thought that in many cities, and this is, I think, very much open for debate, we found maybe some cities don't have triggers, and we have conditions that lead up to triggers, and we define triggers as just a big event or, or something that happens that afterwards seem, things seem um, in a significant way different than they were before. But it says, as Edgar, I think, said probably most simply, it's a starting point for a, a, a process. It's where you're deciding, where the authors are deciding to start. And uh, we look at the seminal change, we look at coalitions, and we look about these cross-sectoral solutions. And we asked all of the case study authors in the methodological note to, uh, to address these questions, to ask these questions of the cities. I don't, I don't know if it's necessary at this late hour Friday to walk you through, <laughs> walk you through <laughs> these kind of detailed questions. But that was me. Did you want me to say something else about why case studies or anything like no. this? That's good? Okay. So that's sort of the, uh, the starting point for all of this. So my name is Ashok Das, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at uh, the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, so I do most of my research now in, uh, in Indonesia and Southeast Asia more broadly, but I have also worked uh, in India um, before. Uh, so my few, I mean, when I was doing my dissertation, that's how I got interested in Indonesia. So I, I worked initially on how community participation in uh, slum upgrading kind of projects leads to people's empowerment. So that was my dissertation, and I did a comparative study between the city of Ahmedabad in India and the city of Surabaya in Indonesia. And since then, I have been working in Surabaya. So it's been almost 12 years since I've been working there, and I have witnessed a lot of changes that have happened in Surabaya in this, in this time period. So this case study that I'm writing is about is one of these cases of transformative change, and it is rightly so because um, it has actually it is considered to be one of the leading examples of how um, sustained um, urban upgrading through the provision of physical services as well as other kinds of economic uh, developments sort of. Uh, impetus in the form of, say, community-managed microfinance as well as health and education uh, <coughs> elements can uh, dramatically transform a city. So Surabaya has, uh, has achieved 
uh, tremendous success, I must say, in, in terms of uh, alleviating poverty as well as improving the quality of life overall in the city. Um, there are some issues which uh, are, are slightly problematic in my opinion, not necessarily eligible for a lot of these uh, benefits and interventions that the city has been providing. Uh, nevertheless, I must say that overall it has really been successful. So uh, how it has done it is key individuals who are parts and Surabaya started this e effort back in 1969 when the mayor appointed a very young architect and, uh, at that time to come up with some um, upgrading idea and they were working with um, this uh, not working with but at the same time with Jakarta so Jakarta the mayor of Jakarta and the mayor of Surabaya at the time decided that they should do some upgrading because there was there had been considerable increase in informal settlements etc because of rapid population growth in about 20 years before that so since then they started and then it was supported it, it I mean the initial results were quite encouraging and that uh, uh, inspired the World Bank to support it and there was very long-term commitment from the World Bank as well as the national government uh, but this was during a phase when there was um, a lot of, uh, it, was, it was mostly top-down planning at that time uh, because it was under the, uh, it was during the era of uh, Suharto, President Suharto, who was sort of an autocratic leader. So it was a developmental state, meaning, you know, the state could do pretty much what it, whatever it wanted. But, you know, it had good intentions and so, especially in Surabaya, there was a lot of, uh, local innovation and local sort of ideas and that helped sustain it. So things changed after decentralization which was a very uh, sort of landmark moment in the history of Indonesia and suddenly went from being uh, uh, an autocratic sort of country to becoming a democratic country and also from a very top-down centrally controlled country to arguably what is the most decentralized country in the world and this happened pretty much in, in, in sort of in the time period of a country's existence or history almost overnight. So it took less than a year to go through this transformation. And since then, some very interesting things have happened. Um, there have been other kinds of players who have come into the picture. It inspired squatter settlements which had been previously ignored to organize themselves and start demanding services. They have not been very successful, but they have become a voice nevertheless. And there are... <coughs> uh, uh, and in, uh, governance has changed, so now people in Indonesia and in Surabaya elect their local representatives, so the mayor is elected. Previously, they were appointed by the government. And so in recent years, uh, the city has again uh, undergone a lot of transformation. Uh, so governance and provision of services have dramatically improved and become very efficient under the leadership of the current incumbent mayor. And she's the first woman mayor, actually, of, of Indonesia. And she's very widely regarded uh, as being a very... Uh, effective administrator. Hi, my name is uh, Lalita Kamath and um, I teach at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. Um, my basic degree actually, not basic, my PhD degree was actually in urban planning and policy development. Um, and I've sort of gone a little further afield after that uh, because the program that I teach in is an interdisciplinary one which focuses considerably on practice. Um, so the degree that we offer to master students is in urban policy and governance. Um, we also have uh, MPhil and PhD students and we are located within the school of uh, habitat studies within the Tata Institute. Um, so it's sort of trying to look at, it's sort of located at the intersection of uh, the natural environment and the natural habitat and the uh, built uh, habitat. Um, and then we focus on practice. So it's forced me in, in the best possible way to explore a whole range of uh, collaborative partnerships with a series of great colleagues at uh, my center and my school. Um, we also have a very diverse set of students uh, from all across India, um, you know, very small towns and uh, villages, uh, people who have never studied before. So I think that's also really exciting um, to focus on practice and to teach um, through a range of sort of innovative ways because a lot of the material that we in, that we that we are that we have to teach with is not very suited or not very applicable to the context so one of the focuses of my school is then on doing research and the second is to sort of use innovative pedagogies um, uh, to teach with so for instance we go to the field um, and have studio courses or for instance 
maybe use case studies like this one to teach with, uh, which we actually developed through our own research. So that's been really exciting for me is to, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to be here and be part of this case study, because it contributes to that sort of research, praxis, teaching kind of dynamic, which is so productive. Um, in terms of the case that I'm working on here, uh, I'm focused on Pune, um, which is the second largest city in Maharashtra, um, in India. Um, it's a very interesting city. Um, it's financially quite strong. Um, Politically, again, the institution of the municipal corporation is also a strong one. Relatively speaking, for the, the fact that in India, the third tier of government, the city government, is a very weak uh, political and institutional one. Um, but what we're sort of grappling with in Pune is how to understand the kinds of changes that the city has been undergoing over the last roughly 25 years. So since the early 90s in India, you've seen uh, a fair amount of change uh, we've had decentralization legislation, so similar to the case of Surabaya. And we've also had economic liberalization. So these two sort of fairly dramatic changes opened the 90s. And since then, the city of Pune has also undergone changes that we can't call transformative in the way that um, I think Victoria laid out. But we're sort of grappling with what to call it right now. We're using the term tacit to sort of describe a series of changes that the city is undergoing, um, which we see as broadly contributing to a more sustainable sort of agenda at the city level. Um, so we, the two domains that we see particularly as lending themselves well um, to this is really the sector of transport and the sector of solid waste. And we are focused on these two sectors uh, and the changes that we're seeing there to really understand what's going on um, and what are these larger processes of change that we're seeing at the city level. In the transport sector, it's interesting, you've seen movement towards um, the public bus transport system to encouraging uh, uh, the public bus transport system through the, you know, the creation of a bus rapid transit system. It was the first in the city, first in the country, sorry. It faced a lot of problems initially and then the city government actually got it back on track and has now restarted, sort of rebranded it, and has restarted a new phase. Um, from public transport, especially the bus transport, they've moved on again to supporting non-motorized transport. And a series of, again, very interesting but very nascent kind of initiatives, thinking around the need for a parking policy, devising a pedestrian policy, thinking about the street in a very new way, actually trying to think of, for instance, street vendors as an integral part of the street and as a part of street life. And how do you then work with street vendors, not just see them as encroachers, for instance? So these are a series of changes we are exploring in the transport sector. The solid waste sector, again, offers a very interesting and very innovative um, experiment. Um, you had a waste pickers union that was started in 1993, which used enabling legislation at the national level um, to actually insist upon and advocate for the integration of informal waste pickers into the formal municipal solid waste management system. You can imagine what, what kind of a feat this was, particularly in the Indian case where waste pickers are predominantly women, and they're also almost exclusively from one of the lowest castes, the lowest socioeconomic strata in society. So to actually conceive of these low caste women waste pickers as sort of with municipal employees, as service deliverers. That was an incredible transformation, um, which we have tried to sort of trace out in, in this case study. Um, they've been relatively successful in the sense that the Waste Pickers Union formed a Waste Pickers Cooperative and actually launched a formal um, contract with the municipal corporation. Um, and in the pilot phase, um, this cooperative actually did start doing door-to-door -door collection of waste along with a massive recycling, recovery of waste, and they moved into even uh, decentralized decompo decomposting. So it's, again, an interesting trajectory where they moved from covering about 150,000 households to now about 550,000 households, uh, but again, facing some uh, <laughs> weaknesses in the system. So just to say that these are the sort of the di pre predominant sort of uh, fo focus areas of the case, um, and if you guys have any further questions, there are some additional institutional initiatives that we are looking at. But really, at this stage, grappling with 
how do we see these multiple changes, which to some extent are uncoordinated, which are not, which don't represent an explicit commitment uh, towards greater inclusion, towards greater access for the underserved to services, uh, but at the same time represents some form of change. So we are calling it tacit, but we're, I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'm Darshini Mahadevia. I teach at uh, Faculty of Planning, which is a typical urban planning school at SEPT University. But also uh, at SEPT University, we have a number of centers which are focused thematically. Uh, I am director of one of the centers called Center for Urban Equity. Uh, this idea of urban equity center started because as a planning, from within the planning school, what I have observed is that number of plans that we make, uh, we consider that the, there is a, a unique damage or the a world, world is flat, meaning there's no inequality in society and the planners do not look at society from bifocal perspective, either from the income inequality or caste inequalities or gender inequalities. And so planning needs to be more nuanced and and so we started looking at number of issues in the cities and the development interventions that are there from equity perspective. Uh, our focus has been more on looking at housing and land in cities, but then with opportunities that came by, we looked at transport from the equity perspective and also brought out paper on gender and transport. Uh, we look, we've looked at, worked on employment sector, home-based workers and their linkages with housing, uh, we've looked at also climate change and climate vulnerabilities and impact on communities, low-income communities and so on. So there's a very diverse portfolio because our different uh, colleagues have working on diverse areas. So it is a center that within SEP looks at what kind of plans that we generate from a critical perspective. Uh, as a part of this uh, project, um, I'm looking at one of this uh, technical tool of planning that is present in Ahmedabad city. Uh, Ahmedabad is a, she's looking at Pune, and which is in Maharashtra. Ahmedabad is an adjoint in, in Gujarat state, and Ahmedabad is known for multiple reasons. Uh, it's known because the India's uh, independence movement started from there. And it started from there because that's an interesting story is that the local capitalists told Gandhi, the father of the nation, that we'll fund you to set up the Indian National Mo Movement from Ahmedabad, uh, from Gujarat, and that's how he started his independence movement from uh, Ahmedabad city. Uh, it was also a city that funded uh, Mughal trade in 500 years back. It's, a, it's an entrepreneurial city with lots of uh, what we call philanthropic capital uh, history uh, as a background to the city. Uh, but city is also transformed over time, and uh, there's another. F so as far as urban planning is concerned, uh, because of SEPT's presence, there have been many, many innovative projects in the city. The city has the largest BRTS system in India. Uh, but city also has, and also city has uh, done very in interesting participatory slum upgrading program to which I think he referred to. He did a study on it. But city has another face, and uh, the other face is that city is completely segmented on caste and religious lines because uh, they've been, city has been also a very violent face, and periodically that violence erupts. So it has, the city has two faces, and in many of the planning interventions, you see the two faces of the city c coming out periodically. In this case study that, uh, I'm writing about Ahmedabad city is on one planning mechanism that we have, uh, which is called land pooling and readjustment mechanism. Uh, it's practiced in also some of the Southeast Asian countries. To India, it came from British uh, practice that you, uh, in a typical private land ownership context, urban planning becomes difficult because it is difficult to get land for public purposes. It's uh, the planning happens, the development happens first and the planning comes later on in many, many contexts. And so in that context, uh, it's very, very difficult to put in public infrastructure. F the first minimum thing that is required for any planned development is to put roads. And then how do you get space for the roads from the private properties that are haphazardly laid out? 
And so this mechanism allows that. Uh, it allows to the local planning authority to appropriate 50% of the private land for public purposes. Now, the public purposes is a very wide definition. Uh, it includes laying of roads. When you lay roads, you get <coughs> so space underneath also to put in trunk infrastructure. The public purpose is for green spaces, for amenities such as schools, hospitals. So you can get lands for that purposes. And then you uh, lands for social housing is also part of the uh, public purpose. Uh, and lastly, there is land, some land kept aside for land value capture and then selling that into the market to raise finances so that this money can then be used for investment in infrastructure. So it's a self-sustaining kind of planning model that is being practiced. Uh, it's a technical in intervention in the city. Uh, one, the, among the states in India, this is the on, uh, only state which has this planning mechanism in practice. Others have on paper, it is here in practice. And this has been very widely used in the city, that and Ahmedabad city. And we've looked at this, how, how this has worked, what is the history, the temporal changes in the, uh, the, the mechanism that has happened to make uh, all this work. Because their uh, legislative changes are often very time consuming and they take long time in India and it, um, there's a lot of inertia in bringing about legislative changes. Uh, in this case, there have been very frequent legislative changes to enable this mechanism to do what it can do. Uh, so we're looking at it, I'm looking at both the achievements of that. Uh, we have, uh, we had a very large national housing program, which for the first time, I think since mid-2000, mid, mid uh, India has embarked on very large urban development <coughs> programs. And there was first time a very large urban housing program. Many states and cities could not implement because they couldn't find public lands to put housing units. So they got funding, but they had no lands. And they, that program didn't take off in many cities. Here we've been able to construct in about 35,000 dwelling units in a span of about five to six years. So there's a very large... Uh, uh, social housing in the city as a consequence of this mechanism making lands available for that. The part, so lower income housing in the city is spread all over the city because otherwise typically in a developing country context, the low, uh, low income housing is pushed onto the urban peripheries and then they lose out on employment, etc. So here that's made possible. But have used to looking at any development dynamics from both the sides. Uh, this what we have also find that this is a very, very useful mechanism, but it also has certain limitations in terms of its operation. So it's looking at both achievements and what it can't do and what it can do. Uh, so if anybody interested, one could have more discussion on it. Thank yes. you very much. I hope in question answer we can come to this question, why did it work here, though the law actually exists there for everywhere. So it would be very interesting. Show you up. Thank you, um, Annie, and thank you. Victoria. My name is Shwaib. My name is Shwaib Bwasa, and I'm from uh, Makere University, Associate Professor in the Department of Geography. Um, Makere University is an old institution, uh, and I work on generally urban development, sustainability, start off in housing, and looking at urban services and utilities. And lately, I'm working on urban resilience via the climate change discourse, uh, participated in the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report as a lead author on the chapter on spatial planning infrastructure um, and housing. And I'm also part of the um, IPCC Special Report on Sustainable Land Management uh, for the Special Report, uh, the run-up to the Sixth Assessment Report. Um, the other kind of work I'm involved in from Uganda and Kampala Paseas, the springboard is also related to risk reduction um, in urban systems. And from that angle, I'm also part of a global network of uh, researchers on disaster risk reduction through the International Council for Science Research Program on Integrated Research on Disaster Risk Reduction and Future Earth. Um, coming to the case study in Kampala that um, working on, um, it's focused on the transformation that we think 
occurred at the period when Kampala and Uganda was generally emerging out of war. And there were lots of things in terms of policy direction and in terms of also background. We're familiar with the structure adjustment programs, which very much shaped the uh, nature in which the state or the states in sub-Saharan Africa uh, changed the approach to service delivery, from, which is pretty much described as a withdrawal from you know, public services, largely speaking. So there is an emphasis on policy guidance and policy development and less on actual implementation of service delivery. And that is something that was very characteristic in Kampala in the 1990s with the national program on um, rehabilitation of the economy uh, emerging out of war. And, and, and therefore we had the um, utility public corporation called the National Water and Sewage Corporation, which is still called the SEM. Uh, still functioning and it's expanded. I uh, just read an article actually on Twitter that it's uh, planning to extend water supply in rural areas. So it's already spread out to over 200 towns in, in, in the country, but now planning by 2020 to extend water supply to um, rural areas in Uganda. So that is one of the actors in this uh, idea of transformation in Kampala. And then the other actor, which is uh, Kampala City Council by then, a local government or district. Um, managed by an elected council with the mayor and technical staff, they used to call technical arm of KCC and, and the political arm of KCC, both of which were struggling to re-establish themselves as agencies of delivery of services and, and connected to the uh, citizens in, in Kampala and Uganda in general. Um, and, and behind that, there were other processes going on connected to the global um, infrastructure and structures of adjustment and multilateral, bilateral uh, financing mechanism and architecture, architecture. And for a country like Uganda, a city that is very much dependent on aid, that actually shapes a lot of what goes on and what we're seeing also in this case study about transformation. So the, these two institutions were um, struggling a little bit, but uh, perhaps many conditions or reasons were at play, but the critical ones that we're thinking about and writing about uh, is the culture that evolved around um, performance, um, our results-based uh, management in both institutions, one of which KCC developed a strategic um, framework for reform, and then National Transfer Corporation adopted the results-based uh, management approach, and then it started in innovatively creating um, systems like the internal designated area management systems in, with a heavy incentivization of, on, on, this, on the part of the staff so that they can increase connections, rec, you know, collect the um, revenue for water supply and things like that. And, and, and then KCC, uh, National Water was, is, is in charge of sewage treatment and then KCC is in charge of on-site um, uh, fecal sludge management. But over 60% of the population in Kampala is poor and over 90 use spit latrines, which is on site. And therefore only about uh, seven to nine percent are connected to the sewer. So this huge problem and gap of managing the fecal sludge with the shrinking space to dig up new pit latrines, coupling to create this momentum for a transformation in terms of increasing coverage, affordability for fecal sludge management. So, Strategic alliances evolved with civil society organization and Kampala Capital City Authority, which is now also a quasi-public agency, given that it was, it's managed by the state uh, directly under the president's office. So it, is, it has two faces, the, the state and then the local government. And, and, and therefore the legitimacy of both institutions were uh, really in question and are still very much in question. So around this strategic alliances, the transformation occurring is the, um, you're going through a business model that is increasing coverage in terms of fecal sludge management using simple uh, technology like the GALPA to uh, enable people to make their pit latrines or sanitation options more uh, cleanable, emptyable and reusable. Uh, of course, there are questions and there are issues around feasibility, but also um, uh, hygiene challenges. So, but who knows what it means or what it would be like if the um, the business model is sanitized in order to sanitize the city to increase coverage. So, those are the many questions around that and the challenges for this transformation that is going on. 
and, and, and I can speak to you more about this case study in much more detail uh, at a later stage. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm based in Cape Town, University of Cape Town, in fact, and um, uh, specifically within an interdisciplinary research center called African Center for Cities. And um, yeah, and I try and be a delinquent there. So that's kind of, I'm supposed to run the place, but I try and avoid that at all costs. Um, so I get involved in research projects and things I know very little about. Um, the center, um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I've got an amazing set of colleagues, and we do three kinds of things, I guess. One is we're trying to re, re, reimagine the way knowledge production happens around urban questions by doing co-production uh, with the public sector, civil society actors, and so forth, and a range of problem-driven thematics. And that's all very, very Cape Town focused so that we're really grounded in our own backyard. And then the second mandate is to strengthen the academic and university level capacity around research and teaching across the sub-Saharan Africa. So this is really about, so with the structural adjustment processes, the you know, higher education was wiped out in most of sub-Saharan Africa, and within that, specifically planning and urban development and so forth. So we kind of have a long road to travel to rebuild that intellectual and teaching capacity. But obviously, the world is a different place. Urbanization is complex. Uh, and we've got to figure out how to deal with the urban transition with very little resources, massive demand, and uh, rather um, um, incomplete institutions. And then thirdly, um, yeah, I, I, I'm fairly uh, eclectic. I work on theoretical questions to try and problematize the way the city is theorized. Um, and I do that with artists and with anthropologists and so forth. Um, and then I work on policy questions, um, ranging from governance to environmental sustainability to green economy and so on. And I kind of enjoy the challenge of working across scales from sort of neighborhood to the na nation, uh, pan-African and global. And then my third area of practice is more creative. Uh, I, I work in a magazine called Cityscapes, which in a nutshell is kind of Monocle meets New Yorker, uh, mm -hmm. but from a Global South perspective. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we try and give an artistic representation of the complexity of urbanism across the global south using reportage, photography, and so forth. Um, my case study is Johannesburg for this project. Um, and I'm trying to make sense of a fairly ambitious reform uh, in the city of Johannesburg, trying to use all of the jargon and the excitement around TOD to effect a highly political project to deal with the question of racial segregation that have been embedded in the city in a profound way due to 140 years of racialized planning uh, and operationalization. And um, you've got to read the case to know more. Thank you. I am Rebecca Abers, and I, I'm a professor at the University of Brasilia. I have a PhD in, political, in, in um, urban planning, but I'm a professor of political science and that sort of happened because my research into planning processes ended up focusing on the political processes that make planning in innovations possible. Basically, that's sort of how I got to um, where I am. I am one of the coordinators of a research group in our institute called HESOCI, which is, um, stands for, in Portuguese, Rethinking the Relationship Between Society and the State. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and we do a lot of rethinking, but it basically brings together people who are doing research on the relationship between social movements and the state, on participatory initiatives, and on activism, basically. And we're doing lots of work on, along those lines. Um, my own work has basically I, uh, focused on the intersection of three different themes, one of which is the, um, the process of uh, of construction of new institutional of new institutions, especially participatory institutions, and that um, my first initiative along those lines was my doctoral thesis on the participatory budget in Porto Alegre in the 1990s, which was a um, a, a fascinating example of of the institution of a completely different mode of decision making that focused on the distribution of infrastructure to. Uh, communities in a way that was very redistributive, redistributive. And my study of that focused on kind of the politics of what that made it possible for this very you know, important change to occur at that time. Um, out of that, I have since then been, uh, done substantial research 
accompanying the evolution of the Workers' Party, which is the political party responsible for the implementation of that policy and of a lot of other small uh, uh, in municipal level innovations in the 1990s with a, with a strong bent towards participatory initiatives of various kinds. There's a lot of stuff that went on in the 1990s led by this party and then the Workers Party um, won the presidency of Brazil in the two th in 2003 and spent uh, 14, 15, 14 years, 13 years uh, uh, governing the country. And so I kind of done, kind of followed the evolution of this party and its way of doing um, uh, policy making and including a lot of research on participatory initiatives at the federal level, et cetera. And along those lines, a third sort of general theme that I've been doing since that beginning point is, is, is how infrastructure policies, how participation works in the area of infrastructure. Because the participatory budget is basically about infrastructure, but in the 2000s, probably the, the field in which the Workers' Party government was least participatory uh, was both economic policy, obviously, monetary policy, no participation, but also infrastructure policy. But there was a huge um, Im uh, impulse by that government to promote large-scale infrastructure. The probably most famous, well-known internationally example is the Belo Monte Dam, which got a lot of bad press for its um, lack of communication with local indigenous groups and the poor. And so there were huge negative impacts on people. And this is the same political party that uh, in the 90s was working with local communities about infrastructure. So I've, I've kind of been doing um, this exploration of the politics of infrastructure uh, and participation um, over these different um, types of governments and different sizes of infrastructure. Um, in the two cases studies that, I, that I'm looking at, this story kind of plays out. I, I'm looking at both Porto Alegre, kind of updating of that research I did in the 1990s, and of another city in Brazil, Belo Horizonte, that has some very innovative um, policies related to slum, slum infrastructure, and um, that also promoted participatory uh, approaches in the 1990s. And basically in both of the stories, I've been able to show how the, this, emph this increasing emphasis by the federal government on large-scale infrastructure, incre increasing funding for cities with large-scale infrastructures, has uh, interfered with the more participatory logic of those smaller-scale local um, efforts. So that's kind of what I've been doing in the, in the two case studies. My name is Carolina. I'm an assistant professor at the University of um, Wisconsin-Madison. I also got my PhD in urban planning um, and I now teach in a department that's called civic society, Civil Society and Community Studies. So all my classes are around community-based planning, community-based research, um, how to make sure that academic research is more accountable to the communities that we exist in. Um, interestingly enough, I actually have my BA in dance. And so um, some of my research interests are really kind of at this, this contradictory role that cultural planning plays in, in specifically in low-income communities of color. Um, as most of you know, a lot of the work that happens around cultural planning ends up in gentrification. So um, this kind of intersection between community-based planning and responses to um, gentrification often use both culture as a form of resistance, but then culture also is, plays an important role in the gentrification process. So when I'm working in community, um, I most often work in low-income communities of color, so specifically Mexican immigrant communities. I also work with black communities up in Oakland and Southern California. And in working in immigrant communities, you start learning real quick that community-based planning doesn't stop at any border. Um, we are actually have lots of transnational communities in the Mexican immigrant community and so the planning that takes place isn't just localized. Rather a lot of the planning that's happening in immigrant communities is transnational planning. Um, so that took me to Mexico and I work with, in a community in, in Oaxaca with Oaxacan Zapotec indigenous communities. And once you enter those communities, you learn about different forms of community-based planning that go way, way back into indigenous governance. Um, in Spanish, we call that usos y costumbres. Usos y costumbres goes way even like be before colonization and how folks organize themselves to do their own plans and also have to respond simultaneously to kind of outside pressures that try and shape the way they make their own decisions and their own planning forms. And so that also brings me to um, different forms that 
communities organize themselves, plan for themselves, resist in different places in Mexico. So um, while in Oaxaca, I'm, I'm not just working in indigenous communities, I'm also moving towards the urban center because gentrification is not just happening, as you all know, here in DC as well. Um, gentrification is happening all over the place, including places like Oaxaca. And, um, and today I'm here because um, I'm doing a case study on Guadalajara. And in Guadalajara, it's interesting. Um, oftentimes, civil society or community organizations, we have, um, we have these proposals that we see in different places. We try and replicate them. We think they're empowering. One of these, thing, these proposals that in most places have been really rooted in like community-based organizations or at least in civil society, with a lot of support from the state have been these ideas of ciclovias. I don't think you have one in, in DC, but it's um, in LA it's called ciclavia. It was, in, it was inspired by the Colombian ciclovia where they close kind of like this large avenue. Um, if you haven't been to one, just the, anyways, they close a big avenue where cars usually go on and it's just open to bikes. And if you haven't been to one, in LA there's one like three times a year, in Mexico City there's one every Sunday, in Guadalajara there's one every Sunday. It kind of blows your mind and it does make you think, in my opinion, that another world is possible because it breaks up like, wow, we really could close these streets, especially in California too, yeah, I mean, you could think about it. Um, we can really just make this for bikes, like it doesn't have to be, you know, so it just something happened and it made it possible and there it is and you're riding with a whole bunch of people on, their, on your bikes, right? But usually in the places that I've been to, at least in, um, in LA, for example, that's where the change starts and ends, right? It, it's, it's, it's powerful, it's that one day, it does make you imagine the city in a different way. But in Guadalajara, what we're seeing is almost like a snowball effect that that event allowed um, different organizations to kind of see their power together collectively and at the same time work with the state and push something like that and at the same time has allowed for different initiatives to be pushed that maybe have more, um, more staying power uh, like for example transparency policies where now civil society has more access to information that they didn't have before or um, the, another one is like trying to push something like participatory budgeting process or now they have more money to um, implement uh, infrastructure for pedestrians, not just kind of like big infrastructure. So things that have actually kind of fallen in line because these organizations came together, did something well, one, which I, I think is an important part of the story, and worked with the government. And then after that, what happens in Guadalajara is that the local government it was kind of like a political opening for a new government to come in because in Mexico, like maybe here, we're kind of tired of the political options that we have in terms of electoral politics. So it creates a space for a new political party to come in. And so this political party is pretty and smart, in my, in my opinion, and decides to kind of grab some of the political activists that have been pushing this platform and include them, integrate them, integrate, question mark, co-opt, question mark, include question mark, we're still trying to see what it really is, um, into governance to help kind of push this platform forward. So that's kind of where the story is at right now. Um, we have yet to see where it goes. I think we have a lot to learn from kind of where these other cases have gone. Um, yeah, so that's my part. Thank you. We are incredibly grateful. So I want to open it up for question comments. I remember in the beginning I said it's, it's a happy hour kind of meeting so you can ask any kind of question <laughs> you want uh, who they are what they want to do but think about it like think about you walked into a cocktail party and the <laughs> seven smartest people in the room they also happen to be writing case studies for us <laughs> think about that so you can ask anything um, let's take these three this is lots to uh, digest uh, let's start with uh, you can just volunteer I'm not going to point to anyone uh, any question of the three you want to answer, if you remember Jessica's question of transformation, then the question of climate change, and the question of real participatory processes. Um, who wants to go first? All right. Well, Jessica, love the question in my lap, so I'll respond. Um, so the 
The TOD stuff in Joburg is fascinating, and one of the points I don't have space to develop in the paper, but what strikes me is in the 1980s, when um, the urban debate was being surfaced in South Africa around um, the intractability of the apartheid city, um, the, there were two planning theorists uh, who were homegrown, uh, David Dewar and Rulof Eitan Bogard. And, um, and they kind of wrote extensively about a uh, counter uh, planning vision uh, that could uh, unravel uh, the apartheid city. And what is fascinating about that is that it's proved immensely influential and that had a very strong TOD grounding. This is in the mid early 1980s, mid 1980s. And then when the negotiated settlement happened uh, at a national level to negotiate the new constitution in, in 90, from 91 to 94, there were two sub-chambers, one dealing with the new system of local government and the second chamber dealt with the new system of housing delivery and urban management. And in both of those chambers, if you read the archives on the debates they had over a two-year period, the work of, of Dewar, Aiton Bogart, is absolutely fundamental. And in fact, they were both at the planning school at UCT. And all of the activists and negotiators in those political processes were trained as planners in that school. And so one of the sort of bizarre things about South Africa is that there was this absolute clarity about what the spatial imaginary was in terms of reversing racialized planning. And then over a 20-year period, it kind of just fails, right? So it's, a, it's across every piece of legislation and so on and so on. So, so what is interesting about this case is that the mayor in Johannesburg said, how do we make what is, so the, the problem with TOD is it's a kind of, it's a citywide frame and it has a very high bar for implementation because it assumes control over an incredibly expansive territory and a set of institutional complexities. And you can kind of never really get it right because you never have control of all of that stuff. And what the case is about is a mayor that said, like, this is crazy, we'll never do this, so let's be much more precise in space and demonstrate uh, in cultural terms the potential transformative power of this approach to planning, but take the real estate market seriously, engage the private sector proactively, deal with the nimbyism factor, politicize that, and make sure that we can align the sectoral departments behind these highly focused interventions to, in a way, do proof of concept. And that's the story. That's the kind of core of it. And, and so one of the things which I can't do in this, this, this piece, but that I'm still kind of grappling with, is how these comprehensive, multi-sectoral, integrated planning paradigms is its own worst enemy in real political terms. And I think there's something about that that we need to be much more explicit in both our theorization and in how we think about policy. Um, and then I want to make a quick small point on your other question because I'm totally inspired by this story and the Surabaya story and so on. And again, I think it's a thematic that isn't dealt with enough, and that is the question of cultural animation, right? So in many of these places, the sort of popular culture is, or mile, is miles away from the political normative ideals about participatory governance, inclusive planning, multiculturalism, and so forth. And we struggle to deal, if you will, with the bigotry and with the crassness of popular cultural currents in society, right? And it's ambiguous, right? So there's some really fantastic communitarian elements of it, but there's also some really discriminatory, bigoted elements in popular culture. And so, the, 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 so in my mind, if one wants to really think about political animation, you have to go to the realm of cultural animation as a way of giving people an emotional experience of a different way of being in the city and with other citizens. And this is kind of why I think this story is so powerful, is because it uses a, an emotional hook to create a different set of political expectations mm -hmm. and coalitions. And we kind of don't really have a language to talk about love, to talk about emotions, to talk about pleasure, about desire, about joy, and so forth because our planning language is all about these highly abstracted notions of universal access to the commons. Bullshit, right? Nobody cares about that stuff. So, you know, so I think it's really important that we've got cases that can begin to kind of animate what those, um, uh, those affective dimensions are of citizenship.
Kind of faces can be you in on the last point that yes. he was making. I'm not going to be as articulate. As no, that, none of us are. Yeah. Uh, but how, why does? <laughs> <laughs> Very articulate. <laughs> that articulate. Yeah. Why, is it, why did what Edgar said work in Guadalajara and did not work in LA? Oh, that's an, not an easy, a hard question. Can I answer her question? Yes. Hard, I feel like I have a better answer for her question. And then let me let me think about yours. One, definitely, I think there's, there definitely can be transformative moments that are, that are temporary, that are quick. The question for me is always like transformative for who and for what purpose. So one thing that's challenging about all the work that we're doing is that we've defined transformation really specifically. And it's basically addressing needs of the underserved. And so that's really challenging. Because I don't know if something temporary can like really address that in a, in a deep way, right? Um, so yes, because I hope that art can inspire us and can make us think that things are, things are possible that were impossible before. We need to think that things that are impossible are possible, but I don't know if, um, I think we need to delve with what transformation means. Why things in Guadalajara worked and in LA they same thing, I mean. It's, yeah, it's like it's the same Ciclavia. I think people in LA are inspired when they participate in Ciclavia. I don't think there is um, the civil society that came together in Guadalajara imagined the change beyond just the Ciclavia, right? Versus in LA, I think the goal every Ciclovia is the Ciclovia. It's, um, some people call it the, este, El, obje, el, el, objetivo, pre, el pretexto objetivo, the objective pretext, right? The ciclovia is the pretext to reach the larger objective versus the ciclovia is the, the objective itself. Very interesting. Um, I wanted to come back to the climate question, but did you want to say something about the participatory planning que question? Can I also ask, yeah, talk sure, about sure. accidental transformation? No, because I think that um, I'll, I'll say something about uh, accountability as well. Um, it kind of has to do with the same thing, actually. I think that probably almost all transformations, in some sense, seem accidental in the sense that it's probably extremely rare that we have a mastermind plan to transform something <laughs> and that it goes the way it was planned. I mean, I don't know any case that that has ever happened. And um, although there have been mastermind plans, they usually go other ways, and lots of stuff happens. And I like to think of, uh, I think that you could think of all of these processes, and in fact, it has to do with like Guadalajara versus Los Angeles. Why is it that the same thing goes differently in one place and another? It's because it's an experimental process that depends a lot on creative actions by the people involved. And in Guadalajara, there was this creative transformation of the same thing that didn't happen to occur in another place. So is that accidental, or is that just how creative people are in different places. And, and I see the origin of the participatory budget very similarly. I told a story during the meeting about how, or maybe it was the last time I was here in this room, that, um, you know, about how there wasn't the intention at all of the government to, the, of Porto Alegre to create the participatory budget. But they ended up doing it and it kind of started giving them feedback and then there was an inspiration and a realization and, and the world kind of, uh, reacted, the, the, the world in which it was being implemented reacted to that. So that kind of, um, you know, experimental creative process, it often seems haphazard, but it probably is very, is the way things, and explains why in one place things that look very similar happen differently in others. And connected to that, the reason why I think it's connected to the accountability question is that there could be a whole lot of answers about the formal mechanisms of accountability that can be included in a participatory process. Um, and I think that those can be very important, but the real accountability comes from the result of this kind of uh, construction, the, uh, uh, the institutional construction of a participatory process in which um, when those who are implementing that process are politically required to do what they say, they will be accountable. And if they are not politically required, they can formally be accountable and not really be accountable. So that's why I always go back to this thing about the political interests that align around something like that. Because it's very difficult to, for, for you to imagine why a government would decide to let other people make decisions for them. 
there has to be some kind of political process that makes it wor worthwhile for that government to do that, either because they're obliged to, because they're under pressure, because there's a lot of criticism. In the Bello Monti case, the participation only came much after the after it should have in reaction to so much pressure. And there were some participatory institutions created that, uh, you know, in that case. But it wasn't certainly wasn't the intention of the government to do that. And the, all the institutions involved did not require that. So there's a lot of the, um, the politics, I think, behind creating participatory institutions that will explain whether or not accountability, or the, let's say the actually doing of what you say you're going to do. You know, or, because accountability can just mean like, say, I didn't do it. You know, but <laughs> and nobody cares. But you can also like actually having to be committed to that is uh, is more complicated. Any other Darshini? Uh, I would like to answer the climate question and then the question that you posed, or maybe uh, answer you first and then go to climate question because some other people might want to com comment on the climate question. The IPCC author has to say something. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, this shasted why this mechanism of land pooling and adjustment is working. Uh, I gave some answer yesterday, but I thought through again. And um, Ahmedabad is a city which is an entrepreneur city, and there is this benevolent capitalism that you allow, you make profit, but you allow others to exist simultaneously. And town planning scheme is that sort of a negotiation which is benefiting landowners and developers. Because if they give a part of the land, then the state comes in and puts big infrastructure. And that pushes up the land prices. And so every landowner wants to give away the land for roads. And so it's, it's this interest of the private capital that allows this to in a sustainable manner. And it's, it's being an entrepreneur city, you're not greedy for making profit or speculative profit at one point in time. So probably that is the answer. This could be your book, Mercantile Theory of Time Planning. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but then it's having realized the potential of this, it got pushed by the planners in late, uh, late 90s and 2000s to say this is a sort of, there's a lot of advocacy around this mechanism in, in the city. Mm. And so finally the politicians have also ca caught on to it. And so it becomes then a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. But uh, currently uh, it's been pushed as a tool, but there are also other dynamics of it that needs to be probably looked at. And I think that's where we are opening up the debate on on, on the limitations of the tool, but what can be done subsequently. There are certain major transformative changes that are not episodic. For example, like struggle for sovereignty or independence, struggle for you know equality in terms of say gay rights, etc. These things are, I mean, these things take a lot of time, and these are not episodic events. Uh, but in the daily sort of day-to-day -day planning issues that we deal with, yes, many of the I think changes begin with what are you know, like, I, I mean, accidental or very serendipitous things, and mostly have to do with individuals. Um, so the question is now, if something happens, how effective is that? I mean, a lot of people say, why don't we do this? Look, you know, these examples here. The thing why sporadic examples don't become policy is because they have to be both scalable and sustainable. You know, so those two things, for those two things to happen, and even an episodic event, uh, I mean, could be transformative, but it depends on how long that episode is, for instance, right? So if it's too short, it's usually not substantial enough to, to sort of uh, overturn the, the status quo. I mean, the inertia of status quo is usually quite solid. So when we talk about developing countries, I mean, one of the laments is that, you know, the capacity of the state is very weak. Yes, granted, but if the capacity of the state is weak, it is usually that the capacity of the private sector or civil society is far weaker because, I mean, in order to develop those capacities, you need the capacity of the state to be able to come up with the regulations, etc., whatever, the infrastructure to promote those things. So the state, whether you like it or not, I mean, uh, has a role to play in all this, right? So that's related to the question of participation. So participation is not a panacea, right? 
so let's get this straight participation is better in my opinion than having no participation but whether you need participation for everything and how much participation and where is participation useful this depends from context to context and who's participating so even if you look at it and then it depends if you're measuring empowerment for example you want to because i mean ideally participation in a transformative sense should be about empowering the disenfranchised or the disempowered right so in, from that perspective empowerment should be meaningful but again it depends on who's who's empowerment or who's i mean view are we talking about so the person who's participating or the community that's participating might have a very different perception of empowerment than say an external observers right so it's usually the case that a more disempowered community which has had very little experience with prior participation or anything or prior space to ha to just voice an opinion is very easy to please right so so called i mean so on so that einstein's ladder of i mean participation very tokenistic participation can be very empowering but for that person or that community it might be different but if you really want to bring about substantial and transformative change then you also have to i mean the word community is very loosely used and i think thrown around the community is never homogenous